In this video, I'm going to discuss the portrayal of professors and scientists in 1950s and early 1960s atomic horror movies. These professors were unfailingly polite, cool under pressure, almost always right, and completely unlike the vast majority of professors, scientists, and academics that I have encountered. As a child, I got hooked on watching the Creature Double Feature, which ran Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4 p.m. on UHF Television Channel 56 in Boston, Massachusetts. UHF stations were, in many ways, the YouTube of the time. The Creature Double Feature specialized in reruns of science fiction and horror movies from the 1950s and early 1960s. These are sometimes known affectionately as atomic horror movies. In 1945, the United States exploded the first atomic bombs, obliterating Hiroshima and Nagasaki and ending World War II with a bang. By 1947, the uneasy wartime alliance between the United States and the Soviet Union had fractured. In the summer of 1947, the United States experienced a wave of reports of mysterious aircraft, soon dubbed flying saucers. On August 29, 1949, the Soviet Union tested its first atomic bomb, initiating a full-scale atomic arms race. On June 25, 1950, the Korean War broke out, turning the newborn Cold War dangerously hot. The war featured allegations of communist brainwashing and mind control of U.S. prisoners of war. At home, the House and Senate conducted high-profile investigations of Communist and Soviet infiltration of the Manhattan Project, government agencies, and Hollywood. Atomic horror movies started in the summer of 1951 with several hit movies, The Day the Earth Stood Still, Howard Hawks' The Thing from Another World, and George Pals' When Worlds Collide. They were low-budget movies aimed mostly at children and teenagers that did unexpectedly well, but did not soar to the top of the box office chart as science fiction and comic book movies do routinely today. The highly successful re-release of King Kong the next year, 1952, gave a huge boost to the new movie style ensuring a deluge of subsequent movies with giant ants, tarantulas, lizards, and other creatures, often created by radiation and radioactive fallout. Hollywood produced hundreds of movies and TV shows in this, quote, atomic horror, unquote, style in the next 10 to 15 years. Most of the movies were black and white, only a handful were color. The movies frequently featured flying saucers, alien invasions, mind control, robots, ray guns, radiation, and atomic war. Occasionally the aliens were misunderstood or friendly, but mostly not. Some of the movies were excellent, many were mediocre, some were awful. Plan 9 from Outer Space truly is one of the worst movies ever made. The claim is not marketing hype. Atomic horror largely fizzled in the early 1960s. Its demise closely paralleled the conversion of movies and television from mostly black and white to entirely color. The hit 1960s science fiction television show Lost in Space started out as black and white in its first season. The early episodes are deadly serious with a homicidal, probably Russian communist villain Dr. Smith and numerous atomic horror tropes, including a flying saucer spaceship, a killer robot, giant creatures, malevolent aliens, one played by Michael Rennie, who played Klaatu in The Day the Earth Stood Still, and an unfailingly polite, super-competent Professor Robinson, played by the late Guy Williams. By the second season, Lost in Space had switched from black and white to the new garish color and embraced the campy, over-the-top humor of other contemporary shows, such as Batman. Professors and scientists came in two main types in nearly all the atomic horror movies. There was an older, senior scientist, always calm, invariably wise, soft-spoken, rational, rather like that wise uncle or grandfather you wish you had. The other was young, good-looking, always calm, 
soft-spoken, rational, almost always right, super competent, and usually single. The older professors frequently had a beautiful assistant or daughter who became the romantic interest of the dashing younger scientist, or in some cases, military officer, who was the hero of the movie. These seem to have been the only female scientists in these movies. They tended to scream and faint a lot, especially when the monster showed up. This picture shows a famous scene from The Day the Earth Stood Still, where Professor Barnhart, a Nobel Prize-winning physicist who was probably modeled loosely on Einstein, discusses the formula for interplanetary space travel with the alien visitor Klaatu, who, despite fearing humans will attack his world with rockets and atomic weapons, has shared the secret on the blackboard with the professor. In many ways, Klaatu, played by the English actor Michael Rennie, was the archetype for the younger scientists in future atomic horror movies. Despite playing an alien who implies he is from Mars or Venus and threatens to destroy the world if humans don't get their act together. The atomic horror scientists bear a striking resemblance to Arthur Conan Doyle's scientific detective Sherlock Holmes. They do not, however, use cocaine. The atomic horror professor frequently had a mid-Atlantic accent, a vaguely British accent beloved by thespians of the time. Jonathan Harris, actually an American of Eastern European Jewish ancestry, used this accent as Dr. Smith in Lost in Space and during his earlier career. It was allegedly spoken by people in both the United States and England. Michael Rennie's accent is often considered mid-Atlantic. The professors were soft-spoken, given to short, seemingly erudite lectures, never lost their cool, never used profanity, and generally avoided small talk. They were smooth, polite, rarely eccentric, and almost never socially awkward. They usually wore suits and ties, but would occasionally strip down to their white shirt in a crisis. The creature from the Black Lagoon actually featured two remarkably buff young scientists shirtless in swim trunks battling over a gorgeous female scientist in a single-piece bathing suit. This was unusual, however, and a B-movie box office smash hit. They were not like this, and they definitely, definitely were not like this. Sadly, in real life, professors and scientists are rarely anything like this a Hollywood image, although they sometimes pretend to be when the cameras are rolling. In real life, brash, abrasive, self-promotional, simplistic, and even incompetent wins a lot. This is an actual prototype flying saucer developed by a Canadian R&D firm in the 1950s. It was on display at the U.S. Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, when I visited a few years ago. It was reportedly able to hover and fly a few feet above the ground. It had rotating blades, similar to a helicopter, internally. Behind the saucer is a movie poster for special effects legend Rary Harryhausen's Earth vs. the Flying Saucers, the Independence Day of the 1950s. If you are too young to have seen the atomic horror movies in the theaters or to have watched them on Saturday afternoons on UHF television, get some movie popcorn, a date with a great sense of humor if possible, boot up your streaming video, and return to the thrilling days of yesteryear when men were men, giants, mostly bugs, literally walked the earth, women screamed and fainted a lot, and nerds actually were cool guys and not whiny jerks making excuses for their rudeness and narcissism with autism spectrum disorder. If you like this video, please take a moment to click like. Please click subscribe and the notification bell if you would like to receive more content from us. We welcome constructive feedback and comments. Mathematical Software is developing products and services to automate data analysis, reducing the risks of costly errors, and improving results. If you want to support our work, you can subscribe on our Patreon page. This is the URL for our Patreon page. Scan the QR code in the lower right corner with your smartphone to get the Patreon link. Our Patreon link is also in the show notes below.